Now let's turn to a new topic, heat conduction. We've developed quite a few methods in structural mechanics, and many of those same approaches will now work in heat conduction. I'll start with an overview. Uh, then we'll use a variational approach to form a heat conduction finite element. We'll study uh, the problem in what's called steady state heat conduction, and that means that the transients have died down and you've reached a constant temperature at any part in a body. I'll work with a line element and do a small case study with a line element, and then we'll have a couple problems. Thermal loading has several effects on structures. One is that the material properties of the structure can change as it's heated or cooled. This is often handled in commercial finite element codes by a lookup table where the user has to put the material properties as a function of temperature. That's a relatively passive role for the thermal effect. Then we have conduction, convection, and radiation. It turns out that conduction is the major effect in structural mechanics in the interior of the body because we have solid, opaque bodies. As a result, convection is usually external to the body and would appear as a boundary condition. And likewise, radiation on an opaque body often appears externally as a boundary condition. So you're really left with the heat conduction problem as the primary thermal effect on a solid structure. As a result, we're going to be very interested in developing solid heat conduction elements. Let me first show a little chart here that, in general, thermal problems are approached in two major ways uh, numerically. One is as a heat conduction problem, where uh, the proper fluxes and boundary conditions, insulated boundaries and so on, are used to find the temperatures in the body. A second way is when the temperatures are known over here and you calculate the thermal stresses that result. Those two processes are really different. They have different solvers, you have different field equations because the left problem over here is more of a mechanical problem, really, and the one on the right is more of a thermal problem. Now, there is a coupling possible. If you've got the temperature field after your heat conduction problem, you can then follow this arrow to the left and find what the stresses in the body would have to be. So this is a kind of temperature loading on the body and causes thermal stress. On the other hand, to move from the direction of left to right, if you have a set of stresses in the body, including uh, naturally occurring mechanical stresses, which I'll, I'll put here, uh, then it's rather difficult to convert those into temperatures. We've all heard of such cases, and they're strongly nonlinear in general. For instance, you can stretch a rubber band a number of times and put it to your lips, and you find that it's hot. And that's because large mechanical motion will produce heat. We've pretty well neglected that effect in our course to this point because we've dealt with infinitesimal elasticity. And in general, then, that's a problem of large deformation, uh, frictional forces, and things that are real heat creators. In the heat conduction problem, then, temperature becomes the field variable, and we have what's called a field equation that governs, and we solve a field problem. Other field problems that we've uh, discussed a bit already are stress, pressure fields, magnetic, electromagnetic, and fluid flow. Uh, so a thermal field is just a classical field in that sense. And we could use various equilibrium ideas. These would be balances of uh, flux, for instance. Or we could use energy methods. And this was going to be our approach here. Or we could use weighted residual methods, such as Galerkin's method and the petrov galerkin method. Actually, the formulations are desired over differential formulations because uh, integral formulations tend to smooth these field variables. So there's a real attempt made here then to go to an integral formulation and that's a natural variational approach. In our case we'll look at a total energy of the uh, temperature field.
because of the advantages of an integral formulation, we would like to choose a variational method to study heat conduction. Variational methods include minimum potential energy that we saw in structural mechanics, Hamilton's principle in dynamics, and what we'll use will be a minimization of thermal energy. We're going to need the definition of a functional to do this variational method. A functional is something such as this f of psi, which is actually a function of a function. In this case, it's an integral of the function psi uh, and its derivatives. The interesting thing, then, is that you can take a derivative of the functional uh, by the variable psi, but not by the underlying coordinates, because those are integrated out in this expression and don't appear explicitly after the integration has taken place. So you're not allowed to vary the domain of the problem, but you're allowed to vary the proposed answer to the problem. Let's define a variational operator delta in the same spirit that we did earlier as a virtual operator in the virtual work theorem. Namely, that we'll let it act on certain dependent variables, the field variable, for instance, but not on the derivatives. We're going to have um, a placid operator delta, which we allow to interchange with summations, derivatives, and integrals. And that's possible because we have problems that are well behaved. We'll have proper integrals, finite sums, and smooth functions involved. In a variational process, setting the first variation of a functional to zero implies that you have a minimum or a maximum or an inflection point of the function. Now, in our well-behaved problem, it will turn out to be a minimum. So this delta f equal to zero implies by using a chain rule of differentiation that df by d psi 1, which would be the first component of that uh, dependent function times delta psi 1 plus, and then you have the succeeding terms, partial f by psi 2 times delta psi 2 and so on. And because the variations in the components are independent and arbitrary, you then can say that these derivatives must be zero. Now that gives you an extreme value of the function with respect to the, um, the uh, dependent variable psi. And so you should get either a maximum, a minimum, or you can get an inflection point, uh, a saddle of some kind. But generally speaking, our problem is going to be a simple, well-behaved one, and we will get a minimum. And we'll say that the functional is stationary for that particular psi value. And in our problem, we act only on temperature with the operator delta and not on the heat flux. Let's look at a potato-shaped body that's exposed to various temperature and flux fields. Here's our potato. And I've shown a volumetric flux. This would be uh, energy per unit time coming in at a point in the volume of the body. It would really be per volume. Then we have these surfaces on the boundary where here on S1 we prescribe the temperature field to be given as some known U bar. This would be as if your potato in an oven had rolled over to the side and, and touched the side of a cast iron oven that had a lot of mass and was at, say, uh, 400 degrees Fahrenheit, then the potato would become 400 degrees Fahrenheit on that contact surface. A second such surface could be S2, where you prescribe a surface flux entering per unit area. Thirdly, you could have a surface where there was a flux. It's The sign convention is typically taken positive outward here that has a uh, heat conduction coefficient or really a, uh, it's really a used as a convection idea. 
uh, but some people would call this a heat transfer coefficient. And then you make the heat transfer proportional to the um, internal field variable on that surface minus the ambient temperature of the outside world. So in effect, we've linearized this boundary condition when, when really that may not be valid over a, a wide range of temperatures. So I think that people generally adjust this coefficient to reflect some specific situation, a little bit like guessing the answer. Then um, I've taken the liberty of adding a point heat flux here. This would be an amount of energy added per unit time and could be directly Now let's use this variational approach to develop a heat conduction solid element. What we'll do is divide our potato shaped body into solid elements as shown. And there could be some hexahedrons and some pentas and so on. Um, I show a penta just as an example here with six nodes uh, ranging from A to F. Now, for the body as a whole, we might subdivide the energy contained within it into elemental energies, U sub E, and then propose that we can sum those up to get the total energy in the body. Now, that assumes there's no energy lost in the cracks between the elements. Then, we know how to do interpolation, and given the nodal temperatures, say, on this penta, we can then use shape functions and interpolate to get the field temperature anywhere within such a given element. In the shorthand notation, we have this summation. The thermal potential that will be our functional will be a function of the temperatures in the body. And once we discretize, will be a function of all the nodal temperatures in the body. So I'll write that out in this form. Then, if we do a first variation, what we really have is a variation of the functional with respect to those nodal temperatures, and then a variation of the nodal temperature. Now, because those are arbitrary variations, what we're saying is that individually, these first derivatives will have to be zero. It's the same thing as saying that if you're looking for a maximum of a function, then the slope of that function at the maximum must be zero with respect to all of the coordinate directions. Now, what we're thinking of as coordinates here, though, are themselves uh, nodal temperatures. So those are the governing uh, degrees of freedom in our problem, not the underlying x, y, z coordinates. The previous figure was for the body as a whole. And now let's go down to the element level. We needed this derivative with respect to a typical nodal temperature to be 0. But let's take the energy of the system and break it into a sum of the energies in the individual elements. Then we interchange the summation with that derivative. And now we see that we can work down at the element level and work on the derivative of the energy with respect to nodal temperatures. And you'll usually do that by looking at the nodes connected only to that element, because they'll be the only ones to affect that element's energy. So we've reduced this problem down to considering one element at a time. And then we'll have to assemble the results. Now let's be more specific about this thermal energy. We'll look at it for a single element. And the definition is given here. It's a little bit long, but we can understand it. There are heat conduction coefficients that are possibly different in the three directions. So we have the possibility of studying orthotropic materials. There are squared quantities in the parentheses that are really the gradients of some temperatures. And that plays a role similar to stored elastic energy in a springy body. 
the analogy is um, complete in the sense that if you have a hot area of a body and a cold area of a body, then this is some measure of the body's ability to pump energy from one end to the other. Much as if you had a coiled spring and released it, it would want to come to some kind of um, elastic equilibrium. Well, here, this body would like to come to a thermal equilibrium. Then you have volumetric heat sources um, where you find that flux is multiplied times temperature-like quantities for an energy dimension. Here you have surface fluxes times temperatures. Here you have the convection outflow of energy. Again, a quadratic quantity depending on this difference between the body temperature and the ambient temperature and then this um, heat transfer coefficient. And lastly, the energy, or at least the potential of the uh, external loads, which for us are concentrated fluxes. In that previous expression, there were nodal temperatures sprinkled throughout. And one of our goals is to try to find the first derivative of that energy with respect to those nodal temperatures. So we do that here. We use the free index i to characterize which node that we're considering at the time. And taking that derivative will yield these terms from what was once a quadratic um, set of coefficients with the u sub j appearing um, quadratically, now they will appear linearly. Likewise, some of these remaining terms that were linear in the u sub i will now become constants. Um, the one situation that is still present, interestingly, is the convection term down here will show the nodal temperatures appearing linearly. The um, resulting equations then are going to have substantial involvement. They're going to have a matrix on the unknown temperature field and then there are going to be some vector-like quantities on the right. So we can already identify where the nodal temperatures are going to appear. They'll be in this um, stored thermal energy or heat conduction matrix, and then they're going to be in some terms here that are going to be a heat convection matrix. To get that set of equations into a matrix form, we do have to do a lot of interchanging of integration, differentiation, and summation. So here we have our desired derivative with respect to a nodal coordinate. And then in here we have our conduction terms multiplied times the nodal temperatures. Here's our convection terms multiplied times nodal temperatures. And then those terms that appear to be loading terms are the volumetric heat source, the um, surface flux into the body, the ambient temperature part of the heat convection, and then the prescribed concentrated fluxes. So as promised, we'll now show you the matrix form of these terms. We'll gather together the heat conduction coefficients, which are given here. Then we'll have the convection terms, which are given here. And then we'll have the terms that appear like forcing terms and don't depend on the U displacement. And we notice those four different kinds. This volumetric flow is positive into the body. This is positive into the body. Actually, this term here will be positive into the body also because that's the external 
ambient field trying to hold the temperature or the flux from coming out so it's definitely pushing back into the body and then here are the concentrated fluxes going into the nodes. I'll write out those nodal fluxes in vector form. The total vector flux would be due to the volumetric flux of the volume source, then the surface flux coming in through capital Q, the convection part of flux due to the ambient temperature, and finally the true concentrated fluxes. Now this is still really at an element level and once we have all these terms we can then assemble them into the system matrix which would be n by n. I've shown that here and it's now a sum of all the elemental en energies that we discussed and then we can stack up the derivatives with respect to each of the nodal coordinates. Now there's kind of a shorthand here. This was um, originally used by Zinkevich and I think it's sort of a um, just a crutch for remembering what's happening here when you take the derivative of a scalar quantity with respect to a vector in this sense. So I show the identity here to show that that's just an identity, it's just a definition. But really we mean then to assemble in the conventional way here with the capital letters indicating system behavior rather than element behavior. And then I repeat the entire system equation below. Notice that all of these uh, fluxes on the right are positive as inflows. And the so-called internal energy here, which was the uh, basically heat conduction matrix, um, is an energy. The, this is a convection outflow. The formulas that we just developed are really very general. They can be used to develop almost any of the heat conduction matrices. So we can now think about doing line elements, uh, triangles, hexahedra, and so on. I'm going to limit us pretty much to the line element and then the uh, constant flux triangle. Here, for instance, is the development of the line element, and it'll be two noted. Uh, it's really a constant flux element. We'll use the same shape functions that we did for the rod element in structural mechanics. Then uh, we can go into the heat conduction matrix and simplify it down to the one-dimensional case. So you only have the heat conduction coefficient in that one direction. By the way, um, we are caught on double use of the symbol K for the heat conduction coefficient and the stiffness matrix here for our heat conduction stiffness, but I think that won't cause a problem because there won't be a um, subscript on the heat conduction coefficient in uh, terms of I and J. You may have X and Y, but you won't get I, J. <laughs> This heat conduction matrix, or internal energy as some people call it, remember is a measure of the ability of the body to do work by pumping thermal energy from one side of the element to the other. In this case, it has to do with the gradients of the shape function. And when we do that calculation, we get terms um, for instance, the component K11, which is AK over L. This looks a little bit like the elastic problem of the rod where you get some things that are geometrically related such as the area and the length and then you get a material property such as the K. We work out the other terms in a like way. That gradient is a constant through the uh, element length so it doesn't really bother us and the integration uh, comes out easily. We end up with a heat conduction matrix shown here, which is really quite analogous to the elastic rod matrix. I built a color television set once where I damaged a diode by heating it too long with a soldering gun. 
what I was trying to do was to solder one end of a lead to a post with a hot soldering gun and I had a diode at some distance away. Now I remembered back in college Marvin Jesse who was my mentor in the electrical laboratory always said to use a pair of pliers as a heat sink between the soldering gun and then the sensitive component. So the natural question is how much longer could you work with this heat sink present than if it were absent. And um, I mean to look at this as a steady state problem. So what I w would like to do then is look at the heat flux into the diode with and without the pliers there when the temperatures are at the outset of the soldering process. It isn't obvious at the outset how I'm converting that time problem into a steady state problem, but I'll do a little sketch at the end that will help clarify that. Here's the finite element model that I'd like to make, which would involve two elements dealing with the uh, thin copper uh, wire here and here, and then one thicker element dealing with the plier, uh, needle nose pliers and that would be steel. I found the thermal conductivities for the two and the pliers being of steel are not as conductive as the copper wire of course but there's quite a bit of material there. I give a diameter here in inches of a quarter inch as opposed to uh, much much less than that for the diameter of the wire. Now I'd like to show the assembled matrix. Our heat conduction matrix has the sum of the different heat conductivities at the K11 position because I number that node at the joint between the pliers and the wire as node number one. So I get both of the wires joining there as well as the pliers. And I'm using this shorthand notation where the single symbol stands for this collection of terms in each case. And then of course we get the usual assortment of zeros and um, conductivities out to the remote nodes. I can put the proper numbers in and get this matrix and then we put on the boundary conditions to get this um, pair of vectors on the right where we put the 500 degrees Fahrenheit on the soldering gun. We take room temperature here at the plier body and at the diode. The uh, only flux that's known is the one at the joint between pliers and wire which is zero. The others are unknowns that can be found. Now as usual you'll solve for the unknown temperature here, which is the field variable, and you can find that, and with the plier present, it's roughly 90 degrees Fahrenheit, but without the pliers, if you set the uh, plier conductivity to be zero, you'll get this much higher temperature, and in fact, it's halfway, of course, between the uh, diode temperature and the temperature of the soldering gun. After finding the field variables in the problem, which is temperature in our case here, then you can solve for the fluxes as an afterthought. We can get the flux that's the external flux into node 4. And as the problem is set up, we had the wire coming from the left with its internal flux into the node. And then here is the external flux, call it Q. Uh, let's see, we just called it Q, and that's positive inward. But the numbers we get with pliers are this relatively small number of 16 times 10 to the minus 6 BTUs per second, whereas without the pliers we get a bigger number of 102, which is about six times as much. 
Now because it's negative, it means that actually the outside world has to absorb that much energy coming out of that diode into the um, ground to hold that at 72 degrees. And the ratio of six here means that you, in the short time, would have six times longer to work with this body if you use the heat sink as opposed to not using it. And after temperatures rise and you start to saturate, then things will change and ultimately the heat sink will not be able to protect the um, diode as much as you'd like. Our first problem in our problem session is going to be a soldering problem similar to the little case study. Suppose we take the soldering iron and put it at the center of a copper wire. The soldering gun is at 200 degrees Fahrenheit and then I give the dimensions of the body and hold the ends at zero. And the question is simply, what is the heat flux into the wire? Now, this is an unusual problem in the standpoint that I'm giving the temperatures at all three nodes. The finite element model for this system is extremely simple, just being two elements joined at the middle. So here's our model. When we form the heat conduction matrix symbolically, we know that the wires add in terms of conduction at the center node. We know all three temperatures. The idea is to find the heat coming into the second node, so really what we want to find is F2. In order to get that, we need to find the conductivity coefficient for this matrix, uh, and it's a Ka over L term, which we find. Then the second equation will require only that 2K for the wire times 200 equals F2. And we solve for that here and get this heat influx into node 2. Problem two is more of an academic problem. Let's consider a three-noted line element in heat conduction. And the question is to find the term K22 in the heat conduction matrix. We'll state that the nodes are equally spaced and the element has length L. In our solution, the first thing we should do is find a shape function and, in particular, N2. We'll establish an element coordinate system at the left end, which will run from 0 to L over 2 to L. We'll make a shape function using the product rule where we take uh, X to give us the 0 at the left end and L minus X to give the 0 at the right end. Then our only task is to find the scaling constant C. We do that by evaluating the shape function at the center node, putting in L over 2, and we find the constant to be 4 over L squared that leads to this shape function. We have the general description of the heat conduction matrix. And so we specialize that down to one dimension to get this form for the general IJ term. In our case, we only need K22, so indeed we put in N2 in both locations. This calls for the integral of really the square of the gradient, and that will be a quadratic function given here. The quadratic integrand becomes a cubic upon integration, shown here. It's evaluated at the two ends, and we end up with this coefficient. That completes our problem session.